I've got to stand on the red dot, I might move. Mummy, I don't want to be different. My heart broke when I heard those words. Recently, my seven-year-old said that to me, already aware that she was different from the world and society's norm. I said, as my mother said to me, if we were all the same, life would be boring. It's good to be different. Don't ever change. My daughter's words took me back to when I was a child, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, doll-like child that most people thought played with makeup and Barbie dolls. Yes, I did now and again, but that wasn't the me I knew on the inside. As a child, I sorted books by colour, cars by colour. I felt an urgent need to be organised and check everything twice. I built castles and spaceships with Lego and went to car shows with Dad. I loved race cars, motorbikes, superheroes and Bond movies. I still do today. I also loved anything that had a design component to it, like designing my own flowers into arrangements and designing and sewing my own outfits. In my teenage years, I got into gaming. Sonic the Hedgehog was my favourite and Sega was my salvation. These are the things I love by choice. I could not read romance novels. They bored me. Our spy novels, biography books, and engineering books by Neville Shute fascinated me. This was food for my inventive brain. Often, Dad would take me away to give Mum a break from my intense energy, questioning nature, and inability to switch off. Sometimes, Mum needed a break to which I now understand with my own two daughters. People used to say that my father and I spoke a different language. Speaking in ideas and often in code, we talk about data, technology, networks and architectures, enjoying the what if, imagining the possible, and making the impossible possible. My writing, unstructured scrawl, smartness and intense questioning, meant being invited to attend a class for the most intelligent kids in the school. This would pull me out of lessons and draw even more attention to my already geeky nature. I rebelled against this, and I said I didn't want to go. My parents supported me in this decision. I was lucky. I was treated like a child who was inquisitive and loved technology. My parents encouraged our passions. My mum was fantastic and she always, always helped with our emotions and our passions. For example, I remember seeing Kennedy Space Centre as a teenager, seeing the astronauts and seeing the computers that got those astronauts to the moon. That was inspiring. The idea that we could do those amazing things, I could do those amazing things. As my dad says, reach for the moon, you might get a star nearby. 20 years later in my career, it is still a shock to many to hear my ideas, thoughts, and experiences in leading high-performing teams globally in engineering and technology. The very projects I have worked on include mapping volcanoes in Hawaii and predicting global diversity targets, mapping the coastline of the UK and flood mapping on a global scale to more complex things like joining different technologies together and also inventing digital strategy for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And also things like predicting the cities of our future. Understanding the past to predict the future is what my brain does. As an adult, I know my differences make me successful. Still, as a child, I felt utterly alone, except for my parents, my sister, and a few friends. But mummy, I don't want to be different. 
That evening, back in November last year, my daughter's words, her confession, stuck with me. I felt what she felt, alone and different. I had tears come to my eyes as the little girl I once was became entangled with the little girl my daughter was becoming. I'm surrounded by neurodivergent people, including my husband, friends who are researchers, lecturers, and super smart people I work with on a daily basis to solve complex problems. I began to reach out to my network to find a place to focus on our positives rather than our differences. One researcher I was introduced to over a coffee became a life-changing moment for my family and I. She introduced us to a weekly Saturday morning neurodivergent coding club, Code a Dojo. One Sunday, visiting our farm, the neurodiverse researcher and I were discussing our family's latest challenges. Standing in the kitchen, the centre of our home, smelling of beautiful cake and coffee, surrounded by the visual chalkboards and executive functioning lists of our complex lives. We were discussing my husband, my daughters, and their neurodiversity. The conversation turned. So, Sarah, what are you? Huh? What type of neurodivergent person are you? Silence. I'm autistic. This was said with some concern. Silence. Shock. Confusion. And more silence. Me, autistic. I had been too busy worrying about everybody else to realise my own identity. My identity was reshaped in that moment. I was autistic. I am autistic. Yes, I knew my husband had ADD, attention deficit disorder, and my daughters had something too. But both my daughters and me? What are you supposed to do with that? How are you supposed to process that? And quickly, because people were in my home, all of the preconceptions came to my mind. I am not how autistic people behave. Or am I? And my final thought, how are we all going to stop triggering each other? OK, I've got this, we've got this, pull yourself together, think logically. We love to count. But we love, laugh, hug, dream, talk, imagine, compromise, and make sensible decisions. Hey, we make amazing decisions. I had a flashback. And suddenly, many, many memories from over the years make sense. For example, have you ever tried going to the bathrooms at the shopping centre whilst covering three pairs of ears because the hand dryer sounds like an evil monster that wants to get you and make you cry. That's what we had to do. Autistic females, non-gender specific and transgender, present differently than males, and much less stereotypically, because we learned to filter at an early age. My filtering had meant I was socially capable, most of the time, and highly functioning, most of the time but I still didn't fit in as normal. Could this lack of diagnosis be because autistic females learn how to mostly fit in by modifying behavior to please, rather than creating disharmony? I hate disharmony. And I struggle with it today, mainly because I feel the emotion on another scale. Before Christmas, I was coming to terms with this myself. And I started to tell family, friends, and work colleagues. My family. Yes, I'm not surprised. Where do you think you got it from? My work colleagues. Cool.
Cool. Welcome to the club. <laughs> no shock whatsoever. I couldn't see what others had seen for years. Why the hell hadn't they told me? Or, hang on, maybe they had and I'd never wanted to listen. Autism is prevalent in females, but we use filters embedded in childhood and reinforced by society to survive. Okay, research. I know how to research. I love research. So, I researched from a human perspective, and I reached out to my dad and a friend who has ASD, autism, autism spectrum disorder. And we looked for a definition to describe it. I struggled. I couldn't find one I resonated with. However, I did find a quote by Dr. Stephen Shaw, who said, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. I also loved the TED Talk in 2011 from Temple Grandin. And she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that autism was a continuum from severe nonverbal through to brilliant scientists, engineers, and artists like Einstein, Tesla, and Picasso. So I took this and I thought, well, what does autism mean to me? It's like driving in Daniel Ricciardo or Nigel Mansell's race car, going a million miles an hour, knowing where you're going, not knowing how to get there, whilst driving with your eyes shut in extremely bad weather. I can feel every single information and emotion in that car. And I can play the video on repeat again and again and again in minute detail. The World Health Organization in 2022 stated that one in 100 children globally have autism. Some well-controlled studies have stated that this number is underrepresented because in some middle and low income countries, this number is unknown. Further to this, Tuvlo Figurenko et al. in 2021 stated a male to female ratio of four to one. So that means in a school of a thousand students, 10 will have autism, of which two will identify as female. My question is, who are we missing? Who is not represented there? Who is filtering? The journey we start on as a family today for diagnosis is complex. A journey which will take time and patience for us to discover. Autism has allowed me to get here today. A mum, a wife, an immigrant, a business startup owner, an engineer, a geographer, a technologist, a farmer, and an author. I hope for this and more with my daughters. My autism means I can hyper-focus. I can get extreme amounts of work done in a very, very short amount of time. I can be highly energetic and super emotionally intelligent. Do you know how overly complex this was to get here today? I wrote over 7,000 words in order to get to 1,600. I wrote whole three other stories interwoven together to make one. We had to reverse engineer it to get here today. My autism means I can feel what you're feeling in the room. I'll say that again. I can feel and understand what's happening in the room. Only I feel it like an emotional overload. Yes, I'm on the autism spectrum. And my empath abilities are not what people expect of autism. It can be a curse and it can be a superpower. Depending on how I learn to control my own emotions. I have therefore learned to hibernate, 
process and clarify when I feel too deeply for somebody else's pain. Sometimes in meetings or conferences, all I want to do is use my superpower to get up and draw a picture and have the freedom to think, to create a data flow, a diagram, an architecture, a vision. And this is often why you see me drawing in a notebook. Still, I sit still and I wait for everybody else in the room to finish talking. It's hard, it's tiresome and exhausting. So, to my daughters, I say, you are ready to change the world when you know your true identity. My family and I, autism and ADD, are a part of our personalities. My husband has helped me get here today through his own ADD, and particularly in the last six months and the journey we've been on. I have learned to stop my filters and change my assumptions because of two amazingly neurodiverse little girls who've challenged my thinking. 2021 was the year my family found our purpose, our community, our identity. Our happiness blossomed, our confidence grew, and we found our people. And they encouraged us to be exactly who we are, who we were born to be, our true identity. If you're like we were, unsure of how or if you fit in this world, I encourage you to take a risk. Be vulnerable, be brave, and put yourself out there. Join the club. Challenge the assumptions you had in childhood and were reinforced by society. Break, break the rules that you, were, you thought you should do. Challenge the stories your mind has heard and your heart believes. Find your purpose, your home, your identity. It's worth it, I promise. You can choose to change your world. What are you waiting for?